the adapter. So um, I'm Victoria Wahlberg, um, though most people online know me as Mickey Joe. Uh, I work as an interim security consultant uh, and I run my own company, uh, which is Logically Limited. Uh, the type of work I tend to do um, it tends to be roles such as information security manager, security consultant, um, and, and I know that's a bit vague, um, but I'll talk a bit more about that uh, later on in, in part two of the talk. Uh, but the short version is I've been doing InfoSec for about 15 years now. Uh, and the talk today is uh, diversity in InfoSec, it, but not that sort. Um, so it's a talk in two parts. In part one, I'll use the OSI 7-layer model as a talking point about the diversity of areas uh, of work and research and areas of concern across the InfoSec spectrum, and it's a bit more techy. And then part two in Rockstars versus Plumbers, I'll talk about the work that uh, enterprise security people do across the layers and how that relates to Rockstar researchers and uh, security versus compliance. So um, with both parts, I want to provide a broad overview uh, for people, um, those new or thinking about entering in POSEC uh, and entering the industry, um, but also those who've been focused on one specific area and uh, and, and particularly areas of work or, or research. Um, so a bit of background about why I've, I've chosen these topics to talk about. Um, so I go to quite a lot of cons and meetups and sometimes they can be quite siloed. So you get the more techie ones. So some of the B-sides events I've been to, like lots of talks have, talk, talks have all been about uh, malware research or they've all been about reversing. Um, or, or pen testing, and there's lots and lots of other techie conferences out there. And then you go to an OWASP event, and they're very <coughs> SDLC focused and DevSecOps and code. And then you go to something like uh, an ISC squared meetup, and uh, they tend to be more focused on enterprise security and governance, risk, and compliance. It can be quite a high level, um, and it can feel quite tribal at times. So, part one. I'm going to use the uh, OSI model um, for those not familiar with it. It's uh, it's up there. Um, so the seven layers to that. Um, well, I'm going to play with the terminology a bit and uh, broaden the scope. So I'm going to be taking a few liberties with that. So um, and one of the reasons I'm using this as a starting point is uh, originally I started as a network engineer and sysadmin and a bit of hosting. Um, there's been a lot of roles where I've done a bit of everything. And um, in some ways, things have changed. Um, there's been an evolution in tech generally. Uh, roles tend to be a lot more focused. Um, people, uh, companies now looking for people who are skilled in a particular um, email server product rather than just generally hiring a sysadmin or they want a sysadmin to work with you know, one specific version of Linux, uh, rather than just having general Unix experience. Um, or they want a network engineer who has certifications from specific vendors. Um, and it's the same with developer roles too, and, and a lot of other tech roles these days. Um, and that's not sort of forgetting that a lot of those things I've talked about have now moved to the cloud or are starting to move to the cloud. So there are a larger variety of roles and technologies and there are a lot of things that exist now that didn't when I started. So, um, so as a security manager or consultant, I have to think about everything across all these layers uh, and beyond. And uh, sometimes having that broad and diverse background can be a benefit. So I'll start with the physical. So the risks with things like physical tend to be things like TAPs, which tend to be more nation state. But for most organizations, it's gonna be things like building control, uh, building access. It's gonna be things like disasters, dealing with fires and floods. On the offense, um, the social engineering, um, there's been some talks earlier today about social engineering, um, it's nation state access. And it's accidental damage as well, or organizational failures. And unfortunately, here in Manchester, um, some of you are aware that sometimes that can be uh, due to terrorism attacks. So 
So, um, and for those of you who are out last night, it can also just be the guys from uh, Pentest Partners <laughs> with some bolt cutters. <laughs> um, but in terms of uh, defence, it's usually people like security guards, um, sometimes in tech, um, I certainly had to deal with uh, CCTV systems. In data centres, you've normally got things like sensors, pressure pads, fire suppression systems, dealing with your backups, dealing with your off-site locations. Um, and, and typically, in big organisations, this will be dealt by a dedicated person or team. Um, but quite often, there is that overlap with IT, um, particularly when it comes to the data centres or when you're thinking about data protection issues as well, um, particularly in terms of CCTV. Um, there's also been um, the other side of physical, or, or we're starting to see more things like Rohammer. Um, and so I meant to say there's a bit more there on, <clears throat> on tapping. But with things like Rohammer, where they're starting to use... Um, an interesting physical attack. They're using application layer attacks to have that physical attack on memory cells and cause those disturbance errors. Um, and there's things like error checking to, to help mitigate that. Um, but it's an interesting area of research that isn't your traditional uh, physical issues. So onto data. Uh, and data is really what it's all about. Um, it's, it's really what all of your information security is about. And in a lot of organisations, it's seen as the crown jewels. Um, for, for those of you not familiar with the term, it's used quite a lot, uh, especially in the enterprise organisations. And it covers all sorts of data. It's intellectual property. It's trade secrets. It's your HR data. It's finance. It's payment processing. Um, it's sales and marketing data, as we've seen recently with uh, Dixon's car phone. Um, don't know who else received this email this week. Um, this was one that I actually received yesterday morning. Um, and then in healthcare and the public sector, um, you know, it, it, the data is quite literally vitally important. Um, and we've seen in the US that this is being recognised with HIPAA. Um, and then there's personal data, and there's a lot of it, um, lots of it hoovered up by social networks uh, and e-commerce, um, sometimes referred to as the information society service. And it's the sort of thing that could be used for manipulation of the person, such as in voting, or for blackmail, or for extortion. Um, Sure, some of you have seen Facebook apologies round at bus stops and that sort of thing. So, why do people want the data? So, aside from the standard day to day running a business or for making money, um, that's the main driver. So, so some do legitimately want it for research, um, particularly in science and healthcare. Um, nation states might want the data. Um, criminals are very interested in the data um, but as I've touched upon the data can be used for influencing political elections and referendums and it can also be used for corporate espionage um, and it's a more personal level financial data can be traded for money um, as can blackmail or something for political gain so how do we defend that data um, whether that's keeping it private uh, when intended or ensuring that, it, that there's the integrity there or just making sure it's available for people when it's needed. Um, and that's where governance comes in. So lots of organisations will have internal policies and standard, standards. You might have had an NGs policy, um, whether that's at the company you're working at or here at the university. Um, and for IT staff, there's normally technical standards and systems configuration to adhere to. But there's also commercial standards such as PCI, DSS. Um, there's uh, regulations such as GDPR 
and also such as NIST, which is the Security of Network and Information System Regulations. And there's industry certifications such as the ISO series, um, ISO 27001 um, being the most well known. But there's an entire series for the 27000 series and they can get very, very specific. So ISO 27039 is uh, information technology, security techniques, selection, deployment and operations of intrusion detection systems. There's a specific ISO standard just for IDS. Um, but regulatory controls are in place for certain industries, such as the nuclear industry, such as financial services, um, and things like this only apply to operators of essential services. Um, and the UK government's taken a view on that, and you'll find more details on the NCSC website as to who they've considered. But it's normally utility companies and that sort of thing. So... In terms of threats to data, um, data leakage, um, it does happen, happens quite a lot, and it might be for a variety of reasons, and some of those are not just technical, um, but the non-technical reasons, it's not all down to people just hacking. So earlier this year, uh, the CPS were fined, um, they'd lost some DVDs, uh, I think they'd actually sent them down to Brighton, uh, which is where I've come up from. And um, Talk Talk were fined last year, second time round that they were fined. Um, and that data uh, was lost through a third party misusing that data. And they were using that data to try and help with identity theft. Um, so there's the potential for a financial loss and the consequences uh, to individuals, members of the public, uh, by having that data loss. Lack of availability as well can have a major impact, um, whether that's things like the healthcare data, as we had with WannaCry last year, or people being unable to bank as they were with, well, have been with TSB. Um, data integrity, again, with TSB, the reports earlier of... Uh, People seeing incorrect information online or receiving letters in the post intended for other customers. Um, and it's become such a saga that uh, the BBC have got their own topic site now on, on the BBC News website. Um, so, and earlier today, they're having to double their customer complaints team just to deal with the fallout of that IT failure. So, in short, all the technical controls to help mitigate risk to data um, and that are the, there to support the business. So, confidentiality, integrity, availability, or, or to serve regulatory aims. But in a true OSI sense, at the data layer, you've got attacks that include things like uh, MAC address and ARP spoofing, uh, which has potential for loss of confidentiality. Um, or integrity with an authorised use. Can you lead to things like session hijacking? Uh, you've got IP pool, DHPC, starvation, so people can't get on the network. You've got spanning tree and VLAN hopping as well. Um, if anybody saw Paco's talk at uh, Securite um, earlier in the year, um, he actually mentioned there was no layer two in the cloud, which uh, I found quite interesting. So for threats to data in the generic sense, um, they're typically used out carrying attacks at the other layers, um, sometimes in combination, so such as using social engineering to enable an application level attack. And, and defending your data, it's really defense in depth. Um, it takes more than one control or design to help defend data. So. So, network, very quickly, um, in an OSI sense, uh, you've got things such as uh, attacks, such as ping of death, uh, routing, so uh, rip attacks, packet sniffing, IP spoofing, and in defense of those things, you've got your standard appliances, you've got access control list, you've got firewalls, um, things like source guard and authentication, 
and encryption can help mitigate some of the attacks such as packet sniffing. So in a general sense, attackers want to gain access to your network and gain a foothold in able to gather the data. So transport layer. Um, with TCP traffic, the connections are established at the transport layer. Um, so you've got injection attacks. So you've got TCP level attacks such as man in the middle. Uh, you've got in injection attacks such as Bitnik attack. And um, the defences around that are to, are to do with protocols, so uh, initial sequence numbers must be difficult to predict. predict. Um, and you use controls across multiple layers to mitigate the attacks, such as TLS to encrypt the traffic again, um, where you've got things like SIN flooding, the defence there is SIN cookies, and an attack attack, congestion control, uh, and the defence of that is using nonces. Um, so if you want some more information on that, there's a URL there at the bottom. Um, it is quite a long presentation, but it's a really, really interesting presentation on transport layer attacks. So session presentation and application layer. Um, focusing on session and presentation layers, you've got protocols, things like NetBIOS, SIP, uh, on PC, um, and these can be used to gain access for data um, you'll find quite a lot online about SIP attacks um, and defences against uh, attacks at these layers. Again, it's firewalls, it's patching, and it's using TLS to mitigate. At the application layer, um, application issues are probably the ones you're most familiar with, um, whether that's as a pen tester or a consultant or just generally ones that people are familiar with and hear about in the news. So it's things like XSS, it's SQL injection, it's WordPress vulnerabilities, which is how attackers got in with the first TalkTalk talk, uh, attack. Um, threats, you've got security scanning tools, people out there looking for weaknesses, people using things like Shodan. Uh, you've got people doing unofficial pen testing um, as we've seen, particularly when people make wild claims about things being unhackable. And you've got malware and ransomware creators utilising the, the vulnerabilities that are out there. So risks at the application layer, they're normally um, down to a lack of design or misconfiguration across the layers. So it could be something as simple as um, missing a firewall configuration, um, not enabling a the right levels of authorization and access control. And mistakes with the design, sometimes in some cases that's just having no design, um, or lack of processes such as risk modeling, or having design and build documentation and standards. Um, ideally, you'd have some sort of oversight on that process. But also it can be down to development problems. It might be a lack of awareness of, with the developers, such as how to do good coding, or just somebody simply making a mistake but there's also a lack of testing as well can prevent you picking up on those problems uh, after implementation. So to defend against uh, the application layer, looking at robust design, data mapping, threat modeling, um, implementation change control processes, secure coding, it's things like making time for continuing professional development. Uh, and that isn't always training for people. Um, sometimes it's just supporting people in gaining new knowledge and having the time of learning new technologies and threats. <coughs> so if people are wondering why I come to conferences, um, it's because they help keep me aware of what's new, um, whether that's threats or defense techniques. And on threat modeling, it's really useful. Um, there's quite a few different methodologies out there. There's Microsoft Stride, or there's Pasta, which is more uh, talked about a lot at OWASP events. And uh, Microsoft do offer free threat modeling tools. Um, there's a generic one, and there's some uh, for Azure. Um, but the other thing to consider <coughs> is testing quality check. Have things been built to design? Is the design robust? Are there new threats? 
what if a change has an unwanted side effect? So some of the basic testing, it can be automated. Um, I've seen quite a few vendors around um, at security conferences selling those automated tools. Uh, but I've worked with quite a few pen testers from some of the <coughs> companies sponsoring today. Um, so I'm, I'm aware of how useful the manual testing can be, um, especially as it's not always e easy to codify a threat model. Um, more generally in the industry, uh, the security and malware researchers, so likes of uh, Google Project Zero, um, who are making discoveries before some of the black hats. And for commercial vendors, it uh, seems to give them a competitive advantage. Um, but at a minimum, think about the uh, OWASP top 10 when it comes to application security, um, but ideally some uh, threat modeling and testing. So there's a few links for you up there. Um, the stride, this table over here is the stride, um, links from the Microsoft site. And at the top there, there's the uh, talk uh, that Tony gave at uh, OWASP, the AppSec EU Belfast last year. Um, talks about the uh, pastor approach. There's also layer eight, as some people like to call it, or people. Um, so there's the risks that people present. Um, people misunderstand things, uh, especially the technical side of things. And, and accidents can happen. Um, it's not always malicious. Um, you know, things can happen. Accidental deletion, not realising an email contains a virus. Um, but you do have the malicious threats to consider as well. Social engineering, bribery, the blackmail. Um, so with the with the talk talk fine I mentioned earlier, that one was due to some outsourcing and uh, offshore services, uh, and there was a vulnerability there of people using that data. So in terms of defence, preventative measures for layer eight, uh, background checks, having physical security as a site um, can help some of those malicious threats. Um, and the technical measures can help with defence too. Um, so things like antivirus, I know there's been a bit of a backlash recently uh, against that, but it, it can help with things like drive-by downloads, um, users accidentally clicking on uh, uh, malicious links in an email and triggering a virus or, or malware across the systems. And backups as well can help mitigate uh, an attack, whether that is an accidental deletion or whether it's been ransomware on a system and you can have that recovery. Um, and obviously there are things out there like multi-factor authentication. But really I think it comes down to education and training, helping users to detect problems. So looking out for things like phishing emails, guidance on reporting and not having that blame culture, that there's company culture that encourages reporting and not blaming. So on to part two, um, I'll do questions at the end. Um, so I mentioned earlier, I go to quite a few conferences and meetups and how they can feel quite siloed or tribal. Um, so I've been, been asked about, you know, why I don't talk and um, I've been quite hesitant. Um, I don't do cool stuff. I'm not cool. Don't do research. Um, and, and part of it is sometimes I can't always talk about what I do at work. And that's the case for a lot of people in enterprise security um, because it presents a risk uh, potentially to the employer or clients and a lot of people are under NDAs. Um, but sometimes the, the times when I go to a, a really techie conference and I feel uh, the reaction from some of the researchers is uh, a bit like this. And then I go to the more female, more formal meetups, and uh, it's a bit like that. <laughs> um, and it's all a bit awkward. Um, uh, but there are lots of really great people in InfoSec. Um, and I feel it is starting to improve as time has gone on. Um, there are great te techies within typical organisations within those enterprise IT 
organisations and uh, there are lots of researchers who are sharing their knowledge and time, uh, a lot of them here today at B-Sides events. So enterprise security can be really, really broad. It can be everything from securing your physical environment, uh, meeting SLAs, managing risks, applying controls, vulnerability management, raising awareness, getting and maintaining compliance, governance, incident and crisis management, detection, root cause analysis, systems, apps, patching. It's really, really broad. Um, there's a slide up, up there from Utah State, and they, they've put online their Enterprise Information Security Management mm -hmm. Programme. And you can see how, how broad, and just at such a high level, um, how broad that is. <coughs> so it's not sexy work, but it's important. Um, and it's no longer just the internal enterprise IT stack we have to worry about. There's all the online services, uh, whether that's e-commerce, it's marketing, it's working with lots of digital companies um, or directly with developers. Um, it's hosting, it's SaaS and cloud providers. Um, and moving to digital apps and Internet of Things as brands try to innovate or provide information society services to use that phrase again from the EU, um, presents more challenges. So how does that relate to security researchers, uh, whether that's people in reversing, working for antivirus companies, or managed security service providers, um, or even having those major vulnerabilities exposed via the likes of Project Zero? Um, so with the work of Project Zero, they highlight the importance of patching, um, or even how difficult it can be to secure by design with the recent Spectre and Meltdown bugs. So, Mike Konovisky of Adaptive Path said, your customers are not you, they don't look like you, they don't think, they don't do the things that you do, they don't have your expectations or assumptions. If they did, they wouldn't be your customers, they'd be your competitors. So people in enterprise security have different priorities. They're there to support a business. They have different challenges. And they may not have the support from business to do the right thing, uh, whatever that may, might be. So that could be the patching or secure by design or hiring better coders. So from an enterprise point of view, you know, we want to have good network and application security and researchers help enterprises save through the products and services that they offer. Vulnerabilities exposed can help secure more, more support from the business and the work that we do. Um, and that certainly uh, can be the case, um, particularly as more things are uh, happening in the news and there's been a lot more recruiting in the security space. Um, it also brings me on to compliance. So it's not only exposing vulnerabilities that can help enterprise security folk from gaining support from business. Um, the compliance programs can help them too. I know there's a lot of different opinions on security versus compliance. Um, I think everybody's in agreement with Talis here that compliance doesn't equal security. Um, but I do share the view uh, with Redspin that there is some overlap there. So the compliance standards such as ISO 27001 and PCI DSS require that some of the basics Again, it's your patching and your user management are carried out. And it's getting the basics right rather than the shiny blinky light boxes that help most organisations stay secure. So for researchers, sometimes products such as antiviruses and services such as managed SOC and pen testing, they're, they're put in place and deployed because they're part of an organisation adhering to compliance standards and PCI DSS. So... My advice to enterprise security and governance uh, folk is if you meet someone who isn't suited and booted or look how you think they should look, um, please don't write them off as some weird geek who doesn't understand business ent or enterprise security or GRC. Um, don't be a, an enterprise rock star and dismiss lowly tech work or that it's just for kids. But why go to... 
uh, tech events outside your day-to-day work? What value does it bring? For me, I think it helps keep tech skills sharp. You gain an insight and understanding into emerging threats and how this relates to your environment and helps you think about updating your risk models. It gives you a sense of the work and effort that goes into security products and services, why you might consider one vendor over another. Um, and why you can't also run it all in-house. Um, and it can help attune your snake oil sensor. But also learning something new can be fun and interesting. And it could even pique your interest and lead to a change in focus or role. So my advice to researchers, if you meet an enterprise security or compliance person at a tech conference, don't write them off. They may have more tech skills than you realise. Um, there's some people, particularly at the large companies, who have very, very technical people working for them. Um, the fact that they're at a conference shows they're interested in learning. There's no magic money, also there's no magic money tree. So unless you're in a really privileged position to be an independent security researcher, the chances are you're either in academia, possibly self-funded, or you're um, or being comparatively underpaid, or you may look for private sector work in the future, or you're working for a company offering security services, um, whether that's a solo pen tester for hire, or you're part of a large consultancy or MSSP. Um, basically, your salary is funded by enterprise security teams buying something your company office offers, uh, whether that's a product you're involved in develop, developing or a skill or a service that you're providing, such as outsource SOC or pen testing. And also, it gives you an opportunity to meet your users and customers. So my advice to all is whatever type of InfoSec you are, in the world of Will Wheaton, don't be a dick. <laughs> so, any questions? Silence. Okay, thanks very much.